among us has not gazed up into the stars and wondered, who am I? Where do I come from? How did I get here? How long have we been gazing up at the stars and wondering where we came from, how we got here, where we're going? Fifty thousand years ago, the ancestors of many of us left Africa and headed out across the globe in different directions. Some went one way, some went another. Others had preceded them, others would follow. Have you ever wondered about your mother and father? What they were like when they were your age? What did they do? What did they eat? What were the successes? How did they deal with the challenges that life dealt them? Or your grandmother and grandfather, or their grandmothers and grandfathers? What would it be like to meet them, to talk to them, to learn from them? Let's do some deep stargazing and look forward, look back 50,000 years not over three generations, but 2,000 generations. What would it be like to meet your great-grandmother a thousand times removed? What was it like for her when she was living in ancient Rome? What was it like for her when she lived in ancient Egypt? What was it like for her when she lived in ancient China? What did she experience? Let's stargaze even deeper into the human past, back 600 generations to a grandmother 600 times removed who visited the fantastic cave art, the paintings and sculptures of the grottos and shelters of southwestern France as the Ice Age began to draw to its close. Doesn't that sound like magic? But it's not magic. It's science. It's the new science of the human past which is doing very nearly exactly this at this very moment. We all know about the scientific revolution of our own time, but it's being accompanied by a scientific revolution in our understanding of the human past. We're familiar with the extraordinary technological and scientific changes that are sweeping through our world in this 21st century. We know how the molecules of DNA are beginning to allow us to identify, to predict, to to detect, maybe even to cure diseases. We know how the molecules of DNA are solving crimes. We know how satellites are combining with climate scientists and supercomputers to understand the structure, the scale, the timing of extreme climate events. We may even know how the digital humanities are collecting, connecting, and displaying, analyzing data from past civilizations. These things are bringing us closer to that grandmother, 600 times removed. Because all this is now affecting our understanding of the human past. We may not realize it, but that same scientific revolution that affects our everyday life is transforming what we can know about the human past. It is important to know where we come from if we want to know who we are. And so historians for the last 200 years have been moving mountains of paper and parchment trying to understand what happened from the frail and narrow record of the human past. But that written record covers only slivers of what was going on where it was going on and only covers the last 5,000 years. And so archaeologists know too that it is important to know where we're coming from if we want to know who we are and where we're going. And they've been moving mountains of dirt using pickaxes and trowels and toothbrushes to discover things from the human past, to push our knowledge of the human past past that boundary of 5,000 years and into areas that we can't see from the slender and frail written sources. And while they're doing this, they're, not, they're missing the great advances that are emerging from the scientific revolution of our own time. 
The disciplines are operating in their own silos. The historians are not talking to the biologists. The archaeologists are not talking to the earth scientists. The linguists are not talking to the gen geneticists. And so we don't know the fantastic things that may be going on in the office next door. Specialization gets more done. If we specialize, we can concentrate on one thing and do it more efficiently. Rather than growing your own food and writing computer software, it's better to let someone else grow the food and you concentrate on designing the computer software. Better food, better software. Specialization is one of the things that has allowed us to see new things in the science of the human past. Whether it's from ancient movements, from ancient genomes, from ancient skeletons, or modern DNA. Whether it's ancient air trapped in ice cores, or whether it's ancient pathways buried beneath modern highways. Right now, ancient DNA is re revealing amazing things about our human past that we did not know. We have learned recently that Amazingly, human beings, ancestors of our species, of Homo sapiens, mated with Neanderthals. We do not know this. Many of us, most of us in this room, are descended from a mixture of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. The scientific revolution of our time is transforming our understanding of the human past with powerful consequences for understanding our human present and where we're going today. When we break down the silos, we can work together and discover amazing new aspects to the deep history of our common lived experience on this planet. Let me try and illustrate that for you with four examples taken from recent discoveries. Four examples that will take us around the globe and around the realms of the human experience. I'll start where we all started, in Africa and move on to the great story of the Indo-European migration and the origins of the language that I'm speaking right now. I'll follow with an extraordinary economic study of the connection between Roman roads and economic development. And I'll conclude with the very sobering story of plague and ancient pollution. We all came from Africa. Analysis of our modern genomes and of the ancient DNA has shown this very clearly from the moment that paleontologists have, working with ancient human fossils have begun to work with geneticists, working with modern and ancient human DNA. We can see that right from the beginning, we were migrants, wanderers, refugees in search of better opportunities. We can now detect the different pulses of migration out of Africa and across the globe, m pulses which may have been connected to ancient climate events. Every week brings new pieces of the extraordinary ancient puzzle of our past, reaching back to our origins in Africa. So the first example shows us what geneticists and paleontologists can reveal to us when they work together. My second example shows the power of linguists talking to geneticists, talking to archaeologists. Linguists observed across Western Eurasia a vast family of languages, which through the common features that they share, they have been able to demonstrate descended from a mother tongue. The family of languages is the family of Indo-European languages. And they have spread over the globe to places as distant as Ireland and India. By comparing their similar features, linguists have been able to show that the mother tongue of the Indo-European speakers, Proto-Indo-European, probably existed about 5,000 years ago. Archaeologists have looked at the vocabulary of the Indo-European languages and figured out what the ecology was like of the place where they were living and deduced that the first Indo-European speakers probably lived on the borders of Asia and Europe, maybe about 5,000 years ago. 
The biggest breakthrough came a couple years ago with work in a genetics laboratory that is part of our Science of the Human Past Network, the laboratory of David Reich in the Harvard Medical School in the Department of Genetics, working with colleagues around the, around the globe. Their work studying the DNA of ancient skeletons was able to demonstrate that the people in that area on the borders of Asia and Europe were the same people who migrated into Europe 4,500 years ago. In all probability, the bearers of the Indo-European languages into Western Eurasia, the origins of the modern languages of English, French, German, Greek, and so forth. This is what happens when linguists team up with geneticists, team up with archaeologists. My third example brings together archaeologists, economists, satellite technology, and the digital humanities. It refers to a study done in a German business school, which was seeking to understand what were the things that explain the different economic vitality of different regions in Germany today in the 21st century. So the ingenious scholar in question figured out that by using satellite technology, nighttime satellite photographs, he could determine which areas were the most economically development, developed in today's Germany. He took that picture and compared the intensity of luminosity to something else, to a digital humanities file that he downloaded from an atlas of ancient civilization, freely available on the, on the web, created by Harvard undergraduates. A digital humanities file with a map of the roads of the Roman Empire. When he brought them together, he discovered that the areas in Germany which are economically the most highly developed and vibrant today are the areas where the Romans built roads 2,000 years ago. That's some bang for a 2,000-year-old buck. So this is what happens if you can bring together economists, computer scientists, satellite technology, and digital humanities. My final example shows the power of bringing together earth scientists, archaeologists, historians, and specialists in public health. I have the privilege of co-directing an amazing project with my friend and colleague, Paul Majewski, the director of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. Our team has recovered an ice core from a Swiss glacier. And with an amazing new technology that Professor Majewski's lab has developed, we are able to analyze the chemical composition of the air trapped in that ancient ice at a higher resolution than has ever been done before. And with this, we have just reconstructed measurements, detailed measurements, of the atmospheric lead pollution of Europe for the last 1,000 years. Now, we all know that lead is a very bad thing. Even tiny amounts of it are dangerous. That's why we banned it from paint. That's why we took it out of our gasoline. That's why fishermen no longer use lead sinkers. We were astonished when we saw our measurements. Everyone has believed that the poisoning of the European population through lead pollution began with the Industrial Revolution, when factories covered Europe, mines churned out huge amounts of metals. Our records show that that poisoning of the population of Europe has been going on at least for the last thousand years. The lead pollution in the air from European industry in the 12th century is entirely comparable to that of the 17th and even 18th centuries, you can see from this graph. To our further astonishment, particularly of the historians who knew immediately what these dates meant, there's only one period, one four-year period in that thousand years when lead pollution drops down to its natural level. Those are the four years from 1349 to 1353. We recognize the historians and archaeologists immediately 
that these were the years of the Black Death that devastated the population of Europe, killed the miners and the, the workers in the mills, and abated lead pollution because all economic activity came to a standstill for four years. Now we know, for the first time ever, what the natural level of lead deposits from the atmosphere are in Europe. And they are much lower than anything we've seen in the last thousand years. Now the problem for scientists, for public health specialists, for people working in the life sciences will begin to understand what was the impact on the millions of Europeans who lived downwind of those mines and metal production. How did it affect their IQ? their general health, how did it affect their genetic legacy, the genetic legacy that they have bequeathed to many of us? These are the new questions that emerge for today from the science of the human past. So there you have four examples. Four examples of humanists working with scientists of archaeologists working with earth scientists, of historians working with computer scientists, of biologists working with linguists. When we bring together people from the different disciplines, we make discoveries. We make new observations of important realities that are spread between the silos of our dis disciplinary specialization. By working together, we can create the situation where the science of the human past will allow us to stargaze into the past and discover what it was like for that grandmother of ours 600 times removed and illuminate for us what it may be like in the future. The power of the science of the human past is to be able to use the magnificent new tools of technology and science and the humanities, and to use them to discover and to tell new stories, true stories, a thousand new and true stories about where we're coming from and where we're going. Thank you.